Cornelius Vanderbilt, born in 1794, grew up on this small farm on Staten Island, New York. But farm life was far too dull for Vanderbilt. Growing up on an island, he was always fascinated by the sea. At 16, he borrowed $100 from his mother to buy a boat so he could go into business for himself. What he does is he sets up a little ferry, a sort of a flat boat, uh, and he uh, pulls and sails uh, his family's goods across from Staten Island uh, to Manhattan. And then he develops this into a regular ferry system. The Staten Island Ferry of now contemporary fame is really Vanderbilt's invention. Vanderbilt had entered a very competitive business, but as someone who stood more than six feet tall, he could hold his own in the rough world of the docks. It helped Vanderbilt a lot that he was this big strapping guy uh, who could handle himself in any circumstance. He was quite a formidable character and he often had to use his fists to break into, into business. As well as being tough, Vanderbilt was a hard-working sailor. Nicknamed the Commodore by his competitors, he ran his boat on a strict schedule and put in longer hours than anyone else. In 1812, the United States went to war with England, and Vanderbilt, known as the most fearless and reliable ferryman in New York, won a very lucrative government contract. When the federal government needed somebody to deliver supplies to the various forts that protected New York City from attack when the British, um, they hired Vanderbilt, even though his bid was not the lowest, because they knew he would do the job. And this was Vanderbilt's reputation throughout his life. Vanderbilt used the money he made during the war to build a small fleet of boats. But by 1818, his business began dropping off as bigger, more powerful steamships started cutting into his territory. The Commodore wasted no time building his own steamship line, and then he proceeded to put his competitors out of business. He had a route from New York City up to Albany along the Hudson River. And he kept cutting prices to undercut his rival until there was a point where he was transporting passengers for free. Vanderbilt lost money this way, but his larger rivals offering free passage on their ships lost even more. Finally, in desperation, his competitors paid Vanderbilt $150,000 not to operate his ships along their routes. He just loved the game of making money. He enjoyed it. it. The money was not particularly interesting to him. It was the it was the winning. He loved to win, and he almost always did. In 1853, some of Vanderbilt's associates learned just how hard it was to beat the Commodore. Vanderbilt was on vacation when they took over one of his most profitable shipping routes. When he discovered their treachery, the Commodore wrote them a now famous letter. Gentlemen, you have undertaken to cheat me. I will not sue you, for the law takes too long. I will ruin you. And he did. Vanderbilt regained his route, and within a year, his rivals were out of business. By 1864, Vanderbilt was the most powerful steamship operator in the country. At 70, he was rich enough to retire. But just as John Astor changed businesses late in life, Vanderbilt sold his steamship company and invested all his money in a new mode of transportation, railroads. Vanderbilt realized that railroads were the wave of the future. He realized that railroads were stealing a lot of his traffic. If he was going to remain an important figure in transportation, he needed to get into railroads, and so he did. Vanderbilt, who always thought big, was one of the first railroad owners to envision a network. What he tries to do is to put together little small bits of railroad and forge a united system uh, out of them. Uh, and he does. Vanderbilt would manage his railroads just as efficiently as he had his steamships. Unlike some of his competitors, he knew from experience that good service leads to more customers. In fact, he is one of the few who uh, takes some of the profits and doesn't just simply run off and spend them, although he certainly does spend a lot of money, uh, but he also puts them back into developing and improving the service. By 1870, Vanderbilt's railroad empire stretched more than 700 miles from the Great Lakes to the East Coast. 
his line, the New York Central, was not only the most powerful railroad in this country, it was the largest railroad in the world. And he was the most powerful railroad man in the world, probably, and certainly the richest. The tough old Commodore, who had been such a vital force in American business for so many years, died in 1877 at the age of 82. At the time, his estate was valued at more than $100 million, more money than was in the U.S. Treasury. Vanderbilt, like John Astor, had little interest in charity. He made only one gift, a million dollar donation to Central University in Nashville, now known as Vanderbilt University. The Commodore left the bulk of his estate to his oldest son, William Henry Vanderbilt. A shrewd businessman in his own right, he doubled his father's fortune in just six years. In 1971, Vanderbilt's powerful New York Central was folded into Amtrak. But the Commodore's vision of a country linked by rail remains his greatest legacy. Vanderbilt was one of the people who helped knit the American country together through transportation. It had always been a problem for Americans that they lived in this great big country. How to hold the country together was a problem. Through his sailboats, through his steamboats, through his railroads, Vanderbilt helped tie the country together in a way that allowed America to become the powerful country it became. <laughs>